Hello everyone and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc. This is Rowan's Law Day. It is also National Concussion Awareness Day in uh, Canada. Uh, this is a, a good time to talk about baseline testing considering that it is Rowan's Law Day uh, in Ontario. We're going to talk a little bit about the Rowan's Law case, but as I mentioned, the topic for today is preseason baseline testing. Now, this episode is going to be geared towards everybody, parents, athletes, coaches, sports clubs, schools, healthcare providers, everybody. And the purpose is to shed light on this topic. Many people have a misunderstanding of what this type of testing is actually utilized for how it should be used and whether or not it is useful at all. I'm going to try and answer all of these questions and provide an evidence-based framework for how we should be thinking about baseline testing. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about some of the issues with determining concussion recovery and then making return to sport decisions. Now, the big thing here to understand is that concussion recovery is historically based on symptom resolution. So if we have an athlete who gets a concussion, the return to sport process is usually based on symptoms. And when the person no longer has symptoms, we clear them to return to activity. But what we know from some of the more recent literature is that symptoms do not correspond with actual physiologic or functional recovery of the brain. So it's important to have this distinction met. We're also going to talk about test retest reliability with certain tests. So in order to have good test retest reliability, it should be a fairly stable measure. Now, a lot of these measures that are utilized have um, um, low test retest reliability, meaning that they're not very stable over time. So we can get around this and improve our reliability by utilizing multiple tests so that they all kind of confer a clinical picture. And I think this is where a lot of people go wrong is that they use one single test and they think that it's going to be good enough to do a baseline. And that is just not the case. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk for to talk about what to look for in a concussion testing protocol and then how to interpret those findings clinically. Then we're going to talk about some of the issues in Canada. There's some some confusion happening in Canada. There's some political issues. There was a group Parachute Canada that issued a statement a few years ago that kind of misrepresented the state of the literature. And actually, they were called out by a number of different professional organizations in this country, yet the statement still lives. And they continue to push this narrative that baseline testing is not an important piece of the puzzle. And I'm going to show you all of the evidence that goes against that and the fact that every single organization in the world, with the exception of Parachute Canada, supports the use of baseline testing. Even the CDC recommends that this be done every single year. So we have a weird thing going on in Canada where we're actually telling sports associations because we have a government funded organization that is telling sports organizations not to participate in baseline testing. Yet, as you'll see from the research here, the evidence supports this practice. And so I think that it's important for people to understand this. And so we are going to put this out and kind of lay it all out there for you. I'm going to be showing a lot of studies. So for those that are watching me live, you may just hear me talk about those studies. If you are listening to this on a podcast, your best bet would actually be to throw this up on YouTube so that you can see the studies that I'm going to post because I want to show you guys the evidence itself. And so let's dive in. The first thing to talk about is defining recovery. How do we know when someone has recovered? Like I said, most protocols will simply rely on concussion symptoms. It's typically a stepwise recovery process. If you have no symptoms or no increase in symptoms at a particular stage, you progress to the next stage. If you have no symptoms or minimal symptoms at that stage, you can progress to the next stage. So we use symptoms at our guide, as our guide. If you progress to a certain stage and you get symptomatic at that stage, you drop back to the previous stage and then you try it again. And you keep doing that until eventually you're able to get to full clinical recovery and you're able to go on. The problem, like I said, is over the past 10 years or so, numerous studies have come out finding that symptoms do not coincide with physiologic recovery. And 
one of the um, consensus statement points. So every four years, and now it's going to be five years because of the pandemic, but every four years, there's a group called the uh, Concussion in Sport Group, and they put out an international consensus statement guideline. This is the guiding document when it comes to sport-related concussions. And here's what they said about recovery. Recent literature suggests that the physiologic time of recovery may outlast the time for clinical recovery, meaning symptom resolution. The consequence of this as yet to unknown, but one possibility is that athletes may be exposed to additional risk by returning to play while there is ongoing brain dysfunction. Several studies on both animals and humans have found that after or found that during this recovery phase, even after the symptoms have gone away, the brain is extremely vulnerable to additional concussions. It can create a cumulative effect whereby you have a concussion, you get this energy deficit. If you get another concussion before you recover from that energy deficit, you drop down even further to the point where it can uh, create long-term consequences. Your symptoms can take a lot longer to go away. It can create permanent damage. Uh, it can create neurodegenerative conditions that we're starting to see in former NFL and NHL players. Uh, but it also, in rare cases, can lead to death. Here's another systematic review that was done in 2017 that informed the consensus statement. And here's what they say. Because of these assessment challenges and the potential for repeat injuries when returning patients to sports too early, clinicians are frequently left in a quandary with limited data to guide decision making. Some recent studies suggest that the physiologic time for recovery may outlast the time for clinical recovery. The consequences of this are uncertain, but one possibility is, is that athletes may be exposed to additional risk by returning to play while there's ongoing brain dysfunction. Possible hazards may include risk of repeat injury prolonged symptoms, increased risk of musculoskeletal injury, more severe physiologic dysfunction, or increased risk of neurodegenerative disease. This case right here is the case of Rowan Stringer. So today in Ontario is Rowan's Law Day. This law was put into motion after the death of Rowan Stringer. So Rowan Stringer was a 17-year-old female rugby player. Uh, she died after a tackle. The doctors tried to relieve the swelling in her brain, and the cause of death was ultimately ruled to be second impact syndrome. Second impact syndrome is when you suffer a second or even third concussion while you haven't recovered from a previous concussion. Reports then surfaced that she had suffered two hits in the previous couple weeks leading up to her death, and that she was complaining of headaches after those games, and yet before the final game that she played, she was completely asymptomatic. So she's feeling better. She's like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Meanwhile, what's going on in her brain is that she's still sitting in this vulnerable state where if you get another concussion, it can create all sorts of rapid changes, cerebral swelling and edema, which ultimately can result in death. This is called second impact syndrome. Even if it does not result in death, we have tons of evidence to show that it creates a cumulative process that creates a lot of problems in the short and long term. So it's important to understand how this can happen and why it's important to have full recovery, full physiologic recovery but prior to returning to sports. Because if you get hit again, you can have all sorts of these consequences. So Rowan's Law first came into action in 2019. Today is, I believe, the third Rowan's Law Day. It's the, it's the last Wednesday in September. Uh, in the United States, there's also legislation in every single state referred to as the Zachary Lystead Law. This usually includes mandatory concussion education for parents, coaches, athletes. It includes removal and return to activity protocols that must be enacted. And in some places, this legislation includes mandatory baseline testing for all athletes involved in high-risk sport. So in order to understand why, let's understand concussion first. So I'm going to break down a little bit of the physiology of concussion and why we can't just simply rely on symptoms and why having more objective testing really helps us in this, in this whole picture. So concussion is a brain injury due to acceleration. And so for those that are watching on YouTube, you can see this little gif over my shoulder probably that has the brain kind of going through this fluid wave. 
And what's happening there is you see the brain kind of smack up against the inside of the skull. But what you also see is that fluid wave is you can picture all those cells within the brain kind of stretching and expanding. Now, here's another picture that shows there's different layers of brain tissue. So you have something called white matter and you have something called gray matter. The gray matter is the outer portion. That's where all the cell bodies live. The, the white matter is, is, is covered in, in a fat layer called myelin, and that's why it's white. Those two tissue layers, so the outer part of your brain and the inner part of your brain, are actually different densities. So when you have an acceleration injury where your brain gets, your head gets hit, the brain moves back and forth and has this fluid wave, you get a stretching of brain cells, but you also get a cross shearing because those two layers accelerate and decelerate at completely different rates. So when one's going this way, the other one's still sitting still, and it takes a while to catch up. So you get this cross shearing, this stretching that happens. That right there is the concussion injury. You don't have anything that necessarily breaks or anything, but it stretches enough to create excitation within the brain. So you get all these brain cells, millions of brain cells that all at the same time start to fire and discharge. And because they're firing and discharging, that causes your initial set of symptoms. This phase of concussion is called the excitatory phase. So you have this electrical storms start to happen within the brain. You may feel dizzy. You may see stars. You may have um, blurred vision. You may be confused. You may have balance difficulties. You may lose consciousness. You may not. You can have any of these symptoms. And usually this is, this is brought on because of all of that chaos that's happening. You have this electrical storm that's going, all sorts of discharge of neurons that are firing haphazardly in all different directions. And it doesn't make physiologic sense to you. So it creates a whole constellation of symptoms. After that initial phase, this is the first seconds to minutes after concussion. After that first seconds to minutes of, of crazy excitation going on in the brain, generally the person starts to, you know, level out. They start going, no, no, I feel okay. I feel better now. I feel okay. Their balance returns to normal. You know, they're able to articulate, able to speak a little bit better. And so that phase has calmed down. The second phase of concussion now takes over. And this is actually the more dangerous phase of the two. This phase is called spreading depression. And what happens in spreading depression is that you start to get this drop in energy that starts to fall. So I'm showing a study here that was done in mice on my screen. And you'll see here that ATP on the left uh, side, on the y-axis, this is ATP. ATP is the energy molecule in your brain. Then on the x-axis, we have time. And we can see that over time, this is a group that never got a concussion here on the far left. This is the sham group. They've never got a concussion. Then after one minute, you start to see a drop in their ATP levels. This is the fact that all of that excitation, all of that nerve firing starts to now lead to a drop in energy. So this is one minute after injury, 10 minutes after injury, 30 minutes. Once you get to two hours, we see a significant difference. Then six hours, we see our peak low and then gradually starts building back up in terms of their, um, their ATP levels. And it's at 120 hours that we're back up to a level that's not significantly different. So 120 hours is five days. So during this low that drops down and comes back up and takes five days to get back, this is in a mouse model. And what we know is in studying these animals is that if we were to give them another concussion during this low energy phase, it creates a massive cumulative issue. If we give them another concussion after they've recovered from this, if they get the full five days and they get another concussion, it just acts as another concussion. So what we've learned from this research, and we also have seen this in human studies as well, is that if you have a concussion and you drop into low energy, and then you get another concussion, you just drop further. If you get a concussion, you drop into low energy, you come up the other side, and then you get another concussion, you just go through the same process again. So you don't get that additive effect. So really what it comes down to with concussion is ensuring that you fully, fully, fully recovered, not from a symptom standpoint, but from a metabolic or physiologic standpoint. So this is the study that I'm going to show you here. This one was done by Vagnozzi in 2005, and they did exactly this. They looked at mice, and they had a control group, and they measured their ATP levels. This one says NAA, but NAA equals ATP for this case. And then you have the group in the middle that got one single concussion. Then they, what they wanted to do is see 
if we were to give this group another concussion at a different time point in the recovery, what would what would happen? And they found that if they waited the full five days and they gave that animal another concussion, then they would just go through the same process. There would be no difference between the group with two concussions and the group with one concussion. So basically, if you have a concussion and you fully recover from that concussion, you get another one, then there's no cumulative effect to that, okay? At least in the acute stages. Then they wanted to see if they give the animals another concussion on day three after their first injury, they showed no significant difference from an animal with a severe brain injury. So mild TBI is a mild traumatic brain injury. That is a concussion. A severe TBI is a severe traumatic brain injury. These are people that may be in a coma after a severe car accident, completely unconscious uh, on life support maybe. This is severe traumatic brain injuries. Two concussions within a short period of time equals the same thing as a severe traumatic brain injury. And in fact, 10% of the animals in this two concussion group died as a result of getting that second injury within three days. None of the animals that were spaced out by five days died. 10% of them that got two concussions within three days died as a result of their injuries. So in an animal, in a mouse model, concussion recovery takes about five days. And if you get a concussion during that window, prior to the five-day recovery point, you get a cumulative additive effect, which can be fatal. Okay? Now, human studies, we can't necessarily measure ATP directly, but there's some imaging technology in the research world that has been able to kind of look at this a little bit. And what we find in, in human studies, there was a large trial that was done in 2010 by um, a group in Italy. And what they found was that it wasn't five days for humans it was actually about 22 to 30 days for humans. So three to four weeks for humans to go through this process. Okay, so they compare them to controls. And if we look at the black bars that are on this chart, we have, we have um, three days after injury, we have a significant difference from controls. 15 days after injury, we still have a significant difference from the control group. 22 days after injury, we still have a significant difference from the control group. and 30 days after injury, we have no more significant difference. So somewhere between this 22 to 30 days is when full recovery happens in a human model. The thing is, every single patient in this study had no more symptoms after 50, by the 15-day mark. Most people were completely asymptomatic before day 8, yet they had, they had ongoing issues until day 22 to 30. So if you have no symptoms and you decide that you're going to go back and play your sport and you get another concussion, they can be cumulative. So relying on symptoms to make our decisions is the worst thing that we could do. So everyone talks about, well, don't go back and play if you're still having symptoms. No, you need to be well beyond symptoms before you go back and play. And we've seen this. So in that particular study that I just showed, there was a subpopulation of athletes that decided they didn't want to wait the full 30 days for that study to be over. So they decided to go back and play their sport. And we have six athletes that ended up getting a subsequent concussion during that period of time. So you have what we have here is six athletes. And this study was done by Lazzarino in 2012. So part of that same group in Italy. After the first concussion, the duration of symptoms was pretty typical of what you would expect. Three days, four days, eight days, seven days, eight days, and five days. After that second concussion, which happened 10 days after the first, nine days after the first, 18 days after the first, 16 days after the first, 21 days after the first, and 19 days after the first. What we see here is that the symptom duration after the second concussion increases dramatically. Okay, so the person had three days of symptoms after the first concussion. Ten days later, they got another concussion. The symptoms after the second concussion was 52 days. 52 days of symptoms. And not only that, remember we go through that energy deficit. I said it takes 22 to 30 days to restore in humans. It took 120 days to restore in these patients. So basically, if you go through and get a concussion before you recover from your first concussion, not only do you drop way down and take longer to recover symptomatically, but your actual vulnerability period now increases in length. So if you've never had a concussion before, basically it's within that three to four week window is that your, your, your um, ATP levels take to restore. 
if if you get another concussion in that time period, it now is three to four months for that ATP to restore. But your symptoms are only going to last half of that. So if you feel better after 50 days of being symptomatic, what are you going to do? Well, I feel better, doc. I'm going to go play. Doctor goes, okay, here's your letter. Go back and play. No objective testing done, just purely relying on your symptoms. So your symptoms go away after 52 days. You decide to go back and play. Now you're still within a window of vulnerability. So if you get hit again, you're going through another concussion period. And now what happens? Well, now you drop down even further. Now, the potential for this is catastrophic. This is why some athletes are retiring at age 16 from playing rugby and ice hockey and football. It's not because they've had too many concussions. It's because they had concussions that weren't properly taken care of because we're simply relying on symptoms to guide our decision making. And this is where this is where baseline testing can be a helpful tool. So here's the international consensus statement on concussion in sport. And here's how they define recovery. Listen to how they define recovery. Recovery is um, defined functionally as a return to normal activities, including school, work, and sport after injury. Operationally, it encompasses a resolution of post-concussion related symptoms and a return to clinically normal balance and clinically normal cognitive functioning. So how do we know what normal clinical balance is for a particular individual? And how do we know what normal, ba uh, normal cognitive functioning is for a particular individual without actually knowing what they look like before their injury. So we know that after symptoms go away, a certain people will still show deficits on neurocognitive testing. So here's a study right here called Neurocognitive Performance of Concussed Athletes When Symptom-Free. And they found that in studying athletes at the asymptomatic time point, once their symptoms went away, 38% of them still showed deficits on neurocognitive testing. Another study done in 2014 found that even after athletes had been cleared to return to sport by their physicians, one quarter of them still showed deficits on testing. So we see here that symptoms do not reflect the functional recovery of athletes uh, from concussion. So what is baseline testing and how could it possibly help this scenario? So baseline testing is a procedure. It is a concept. It is not a particular test, right? So some people may say, oh, we're doing baseline testing. And then another group say, well, yeah, we're doing baseline testing too, but they're doing completely different tests. Some groups may look at this and say, well, we just use one test. Other groups will look at this and say, well, we do a battery of tests. Okay. So baseline testing means different things to different people. So you can't just say baseline testing is good or baseline testing is not good. It depends on what the tests are right? Is a car good? Is a car not good? Well, what kind of car is it? Is it a new car? Is it a, you know, is it in good shape? Like, that's the thing. Like a car is not a car, right? It's, they're all different. And the baseline test is not a baseline test. They're all different. So a lot of people will just do one single test and think that that's good enough. But the literature shows that this is not a good strategy. So some people may do the SCAT. So some people may have heard of the SCAT, which is a sport concussion assessment tool. This is a, a sideline test that was developed by the concussion and sport group. And it's a simple, you know, paper. It's just meant to help guide a clinician through a bit of an assessment protocol on the sidelines. That test, the SCAT test, is um, it normalizes after only a few days. So it doesn't really help you in making any type of decision with respect to returning an athlete back to sport. Same thing with an impact test or any type of computerized testing. Some people may you know, bring in streams of athletes and they just sit there and do a computer test. There's problems with this. So I have some studies showing up here. This one is clinical utility of impact assessment for post-concussion return to play counseling, psychometric issues. The conclusion here is we conclude that the empirical evidence does not support the use of impact testing for determining the time of post-concussion return to play. There's test retest reliability issues when you only use one tool and that tool has questionable test retest reliability. It, it automatically throws everything out the window, right? And the way that I um, describe this or the, or kind of the way that I, um, uh, an, an analogy I use, let's say, is that you would never make a diagnosis if you're a clinician. You would never make a diagnosis of knee pain or you know what was causing their knee pain by just going up and doing one simple orthopedic test, right? You're not going to go up to somebody who says, "Oh, my knee hurts," and you do a Lockman's and you go, "Yeah," and try to make a diagnosis. 
right? You need to do a whole bunch of different tests com combined with the history, combined with, you know, other things to figure out what's going on in that particular person. So if you're just going to do one, te one test, sorry, you're going to miss the picture. And I think that's the thing to understand here. Here's another one. Impact test, test, retest, reliability. Reliably unreliable, question mark. So this one was looking at it and basically found that it was unreliable as a standalone tool. So our current data support a multifaceted approach to concussion assessment using clinical examinations, symptom reports, cognitive testing, and balance assessments. Okay, you can't just do one thing and think that that's good enough because it's not. Here's another one. Test, retest, reliability of computerized concussion assessment programs. Three comp, um, contemporary computer-based concussion assessment programs evidence low to moderate test, retest, reliability components. So again, doing a single computer test is not a good idea. And this is where people get caught up because someone may look at that evidence and say baseline testing is not, not good. No, that's not what this says. Basically, this says that a computerized test by itself is questionable. We recommend a multifaceted approach. All right. So that's where people get a little bit confused. Just to reiterate, the purpose of baseline testing is not to make a diagnosis. This is where people go wrong. Okay. They think that, well, if, you know, if I get a concussion, you'll be able to tell if I have a concussion or not, if I do my baseline test. You don't need a baseline test to make your diagnosis most of the time. And I'm going to say most of the time, because in some cases it can be helpful. Most of the time, you're just using symptoms to make your initial diagnosis. Baseline testing is helpful when you're making a return to play decision. Because after the first, you know, week or so, most people's symptoms will have gone away. But we still have a period of anywhere from three to four, and some studies even show six weeks, where the metabolic levels are still low. So we need to have something to be able to test against to see, is this person back to function? Where's the reaction time? Where's their ocular motor function? Where's their cognitive ability? Where's their memory? Where's their balance? Where's their postural sway? Okay, all of these things are important for understanding, is the brain back to functioning the way it was prior to this injury? All right, so baseline testing is not for making your diagnosis. It's mostly not needed for that because most of the time the person gets hit and has symptoms and you know right away, oh, the person has a concussion. It's for making your return to sport decision because after the symptoms have gone away, you have nothing, nothing to help you. This is something that can help you if you have good information on a particular athlete, if you have a good comprehensive set of tests. So a good baseline should involve a battery of tests and should test a variety of areas of brain function. We should look at cognitive and physical components. So they should have good test retest reliability for at least six months to a year, and they should have good longevity or good sensitivity to be able to show subtle dysfunctions even beyond symptom resolution. So this is the problem with SCAT testing. So remember I said we have the sport concussion assessment tool? Well, there's it's easy to do. It's free online. So people will download this as clinicians. Let's say you're a physio or an AT and just go, yeah, we're going to do baselines and you're going to get everyone in and you're going to do a SCAT test. The problem is the SCAT can pick up deficits immediately but those deficits disappear after as little as two to three days. So symptoms take seven to 10 days, but the deficits on SCAT will go away within the first two to three days. So that may help you on the sidelines, but like I said, most of the time, you're just gonna rely on symptoms to make your initial diagnosis. Oh, you got hit and you have a headache and you have blurred vision and you can't walk straight. That's usually enough to diagnose a concussion. After, now I'm trying to make a return to sport decision, that's SCAT is now useless. You cannot be using a SCAT as a baseline test at, as it, on its own, right? Our group uses SCAT as a portion of our baseline test because we have therapists that are on the sideline where that information can be helpful in some scenarios. But we know as clinicians, we would never use that information to make our return to sport decisions. We want to use things that have more longevity, things that are more sensitive to pick up subtle deficits beyond the point of symptom resolution, okay? So things that may help, force plates, postural sway measures. So for example, a BEST test, which is called the Balance Error Scoring System, that's a balance measure, that's on the SCAT. That shows deficits very early on in the process, even, but not even really. It's not even that great of a test, even on the sidelines. But when you put somebody on a force plate and you look at postural sway, that shows deficits for up to 30 days post-injury. 
that fits in nicely with our metabolic recovery line, right? So we're looking for things that have a good correlation with that. King Devic testing has pretty good longevity. Um, reaction time testing has pretty good longevity. So other things you can throw into the mix. Neurocognitive testing has good longevity, but you want to pair it with all of these things, right? You want to be able to show these deficits. So what are some of the arguments against baseline testing, right? I'm showing some of the pros. What are the cons or the arguments against? What do people say when they try to say that baseline testing should not be done? Well, one argument that is used all the time is that the reliability test retest reliability and the sensitivity is not good enough to support its use. The problem is that all of these studies that support that are using one single test at a time. So if you were to do um, any one test by itself, it's not going to be that great, right? And we see this all the time in orthopedic tests and various diagnostic tests, right? Like you wouldn't diagnose a disease based on a single urine sample, right? You may do a urine sample and say, oh, that's elevated. I'm going to do further testing on that. Now I'm going to do blood. Now I'm going to do maybe a CT scan or I'm going to do an ultrasound and I'm going to try and find out what else may be going on. You're going to start investigating further down the line. So just using any one test is not going to make a diagnosis in anything. And most of the literature in this space will look at the reliability of one test. So they'll look at a reaction time test and they'll say evidence, you know, low to moderate test retest test reliability. So that doesn't mean that baseline testing should be thrown out the window. It means that, well, that by itself may not be good. Okay. So you need to kind of add more to the picture. So what you'll see is that when many tests are added together, the reliability of the whole thing improves. And this has been done in huge studies. Um, so here, here's this thing from the, um, from the care consortium. So this is a study that was done by Stephen Broglio. This is a large, large, large study. Um, in 20, uh, this was published in 2019. So they looked at data from 2014 to 2017, and they had 1,458 NCAA athletes who sustained 1,600 concussions. They completed a baseline test every single year, and they were evaluated up to three times after injury. Um, and they actually found that including some elements of the baseline in the uh, assessment on the sidelines improved the diagnosis. So the argument here is you don't need a baseline test to make your diagnosis. Well, most of the time that's actually true because if people come off complaining of symptoms after a big hit, you know right away, you don't need anything else to make your diagnosis. But this study found that the investigation identified key concussion assessments and quantifying post-concussion performance among student athletes that were maximized when they were compared to the same season baseline test. So they, they tried to use normative data and then they compared them to their own baseline test and they found that using their own baseline test was superior to having, um, having normative data or even using a baseline from two years ago. So we see here that baseline testing can be helpful in improving diagnosis, but that's not its main purpose. Next one, tests have not been validated for younger patients. This is true for some tests. For example, the impact test has only been validated in 13 and up, but it's not true for other tests. For example, the King Devic test was initially designed as a test for children. It's actually to assess dyslexia and learning disabilities uh, in kids. And it works very well as a concussion test, both clinically and on the sidelines. So some tests are not meant for kids, but some tests actually are. And so that's an invalid argument. So again, just saying that baseline testing is not good for kids. Well, no, you have to just change the tests you use for kids, right? Next thing here is you don't need a baseline because we have normative data. You can use norms to say that this is where people should fall in. But the thing is, people are not the norm. Some people have learning disabilities, okay? Some people have ADHD. Some people have exceptionality. Some people are way above the norm. So if they get a concussion and now you're going to compare them to the normal, but yet they used to have exceptional reaction time, exceptional balance, and yet now here you are comparing them to quote unquote normal, well, that's not them, right? Are they recovered because they're down at normal levels? Well, no, you should expect them to be back up here. We also see differences in race and socioeconomic status. Athletes will test differently depending on whether they're black or white or Hispanic or whether or not they are rich, poor, go to different schools. Their test results will actually be different. So if you need, if you want to compare them to norms, you have to compare them to age, sex, race, um, 
socioeconomic status, uh, even sports, different sports. Athletes who play different sports have different reaction times. So using just general normative data and trying to compare them to every 13-year-old doesn't work because cognitive function and physical function is so different amongst these different groups. We found that wheelchair athletes do not meet the norms of SCAT symptoms. They tend to report higher symptom severity scores, and they tend to score lower on baseline neurocognitive measures. So if we're just going to compare somebody uh, in, in Paralympic sport using able-bodied norms, it's going to be different. There are differences that happen across the board. So we don't have norms for all these different tests. So we can't just rely on norms across the board. And this has been shown in a bunch of different things. So there's a study done by Schatz looking at impact specifically, and it found that impact testing compared to norms misclassified 50% of the population as either being concussed when they weren't or not concussed when they were. Okay, but using their own baseline, performance improved drastically. So you can't just use norms. Baseline King Devic testing here. So here's another one here. You can see the bottom quote, the, the uh, conclusion, the most reliable use of the test as a screen for impairment following concussion involves the use of a baseline test. So maybe at one day we'll get to be able to use norms, but at this point there's just way too much to try and find in terms of data for norm, like to actually get those norms and make them publicly and widely available. They're just, it's just too much. So I think we've made our point here that baseline testing can be helpful and they can add useful information to the clinical picture and help to inform better return to sport decisions. The scientific evidence supports this. I've shown a number of different studies at this point. You have to do multiple tests. Any single test by itself is completely insufficient. A computer test by itself is no good. SCAT test normalizes in the first two to three days, so that's no good. So tests should be a, a battery of different tests that assess various um, different components of physical and cognitive function. Um, and normative data may be helpful in the future, but I just don't think we're there yet. So basically at this point, we know that symptoms don't mean really anything. They can help kind of guide our return to sport and our different stage progression. When it comes to making a return to sport decision, that final decision, somebody goes, Hey, I'm feeling better. I've done all the steps. I'm ready to go back and play. I've gone to practice. I've done all this stuff. We say, okay, first we're going to test you on your physical exertion. We're going to put you through the ringer and try to see how you respond. Whether or not you're, if we're going to get you doing up, down, up, down, side, 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 all these different things to try and see how you respond to a changing and dynamic environment. If that doesn't throw you for a loop and make you symptomatic, then we bring you in and we test your reaction time, your cognition. We look at symptoms. We look at uh, your balance, your postural sway. We look at your ocular motor tracking on a King Devic. We do all these different things in an exerted state to try and see, okay, I know you think you're better, but let's actually see how you're doing. Okay, so we know that this can be helpful when done in the right way. So why is there confusion in Canada? So I'm going to talk specifically about Canada, and I'm going to kind of tie it into the rest of the world here, because a few years ago, there's an injury prevention organization called Parachute Canada that was given a contract by the Public Health Agency of Canada to uh, improve concussion care in Canada and develop a um, national um, concussion program or a national concussion um, guideline for Canada. Even though we have international guidelines already, you think it would just mirror that. But no, they changed some things. And one thing they changed was they said that diagnosis should only be done by a physician and nurse practitioner. And secondly, they put out a statement saying that baseline testing uh, is not necessary and basically should not be done. And so because they were given the government contract to create this guideline, they were given uh, access to all of the different sports programs in Canada. So they were given access to Hockey Canada and Football Canada and all these different people to say, this is the new game plan, this is what everyone should follow. So all of these sports associations have now heard from this organization that's been given this government contract that baseline testing is bad and should not actually be done. So when this was published, numerous organizations in Canada stepped up and wrote statements that said, wait a minute, this actually isn't true. This doesn't go coincide with the evidence that's going on. Yet, still, to this day, they continue to push this message out. They continue to push out that baseline testing is not necessary and every concussion needs to go and see a physician. There's lots of evidence we have 
throughout Canada that shows that concussion is not covered in the majority of Canadian medical schools. And if it is, it's less than a couple hours on the entire four years of medical school. We have a ton of research that show that most emergency room doctors don't know anything about concussion guidelines or what the proper protocols are. And most family physicians don't know how to properly return an athlete back to sport or school. Yet, these guys came in and said that all concussions can only be diagnosed by a physician or nurse practitioner. The problem is that the majority of people on this panel were physicians that have their own concussion clinics. And so you can see how they would want to make it so that, that everything basically has to come through them. So I think there's a bit of a conflict of interest at that point. But then it comes down to baseline. Well, why the baseline piece? Well, if all concussions can only be diagnosed by a physician or nurse practitioner, we know that most physicians are not going to have the time and bandwidth to be running all these athletes through baseline tests. So how do we reconcile that? Well, here we are. So let's break it down. So first they claim that their statement was in line with the international consensus guidelines. So they, they have one one reference other than themselves. They referenced themselves in this document, but the only other reference they have in this document was the international consensus statement, the 2017 Berlin consensus statement published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So this is the one I've already shown you. So let's see first what the consensus statement said. The consensus statement referring to the SCAT, which is the sport concussion assessment tool, they said, the recognition of suspected sports related concussion is therefore best approached using a multidimensional testing guided via expert consensus. And here's what they say down below on baseline. Baseline testing may be useful, but is not necessary for interpreting post-injury score. This is in relation to the SCAT. Remember how I said the SCAT is basically a simple test. If used, though, clinicians must strive to replicate baseline testing conditions. Additional domains that may add to the clinical utility include clinical reaction time, gait, and balance assessment, and video observable signs, and ocular motor screening. So a comprehensive battery all put in. With respect to neurocognitive or neuropsychological testing, which is in this quote is called NP testing, baseline or preseason neuropsychological testing was considered by the panel, but was not felt to be required as a mandatory aspect of every assessment. However, it may be helpful or add useful information to the overall interpretation of these tests. It also provides an additional educative opportunity for the healthcare provider to discuss the significance of this injury with the athlete. So basically what they said is, it can be helpful, add useful clinical information to the picture, but we didn't feel that we are at the point where we should say it should be a mandatory thing for everybody. Okay? Now, here's what Parachute said about it. Baseline testing of youth and adult recreational athletes using any tool or combination of tools is not required to provide post-injury care to those who sustain or suspect a con diagnosed concussion. Baseline testing is not recommended in youth athletes regardless of the sport or level of play. This statement was so against the evidence that a variety of organizations in Canada came out and said, Ooh, W2F, what's going on here? Okay, so one of them was the Canadian Academy of Sport and Exercise Medicine. This is the sports doctors in Canada. So they're called CASM. That's, the, that's their acronym. And here's what they say about the statement. Parachute Canada's first statement does not accurately reflect the Davis et al. recommendations. It incorrectly paints all youth athletes with the same brushstroke and makes generalizing an oversimplified recommendation on the use of baseline testing that is not reflective of best practices in many individual cases or sporting environments. Parachute Canada's second statement further differentiates between youth and adult recreational athletes and adult national team affiliated athletes, which to CASM's knowledge has no clear scientific basis and is not addressed in the fifth international consent statement on concussion and sport. It is important to note that many national teams have athletes below the age of 18. So again, CASM is calling them out for not reflecting the scientific evidence. Sport Physiotherapy Canada comes out and says, for the average consumer, parent, or coach, this release may help guide decision-making and determine how to best protect children and adolescents from serious injury. However, concerns have been raised that there may be a misunderstanding of the reports or evidence of the value of baseline testing as it relates to concussion guidelines. Concussion in sports, particularly for young athletes, is an emerging field of study with varied and complex evidence that must be weighed in the creation of clinical or best practice guidelines. Baseline testing is one tool that can be used to understand concussion, provided that practitioners and consumers of these tests understand the limitations. What is clear, however, is that the evidence related to a multifaceted approach to assessment, diagnosis, and management of 
concussion. So again, this is Sport Physiotherapy Canada, the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, and the Canadian Academy of Sport and Exercise Medicine all coming out. In fact, if we look around the entire world, and I'm going to do this right now, let's look at statements and groups that are in support of baseline testing. Because especially if you're in Canada, if you're a parent of an athlete in Canada, if you're a coach in Canada, if you are a, uh, a, a, a director of a sports club, you've probably seen the message that you shouldn't be telling your athletes to do baseline testing. They're actively discouraging people from doing baseline testing by telling them it's not recommended. Okay. Meanwhile, all the evidence in the world says that it could be helpful. So in, a, in an era and a time where we have so much that we don't know about concussion, so much that we're concerned about with concussion and what the potential ramifications are. This is one thing that may be helpful and may add clinical utility. And yet in Canada, at least, we're actively discouraging people from taking part in this. This is ridiculous. This is an association that has you know, built themselves as an injury prevention organization. They've been given government money to improve concussion safety. And this is the statement that they've come out with. And not only that, after these statements have come out, it's still, they're still pushing this narrative, okay? So this is, I think, what's important to understand. Let's look at all the groups in the world that support baseline testing, okay? So this is kind of everything. So this is from groups that claim that baseline testing can be helpful or beneficial or they otherwise recommend their use. The International Consensus Statement for Concussion in Sport. This is the Concussion in Sports Group. This is from the Berlin Consensus. This is the guiding document in uh, the world, and I've already shown you what they've said. Concussion in Sport, Australia's position statement in 2019. The Canadian Olympic and Paralympic concussion guidelines in 2018 recommended all athletes in high-risk sport receive a multifaceted baseline assessment. In fact, our organization, Complete Concussion Management, works with probably half of all Olympic sport athlete groups. We do all of the testing for most of the Canadian Olympic and Paralympic athlete groups uh, in this country. So they utilize the pro protocols that we're using. And their statement suggests that all athletes in high-risk sports should be getting baseline tested every single year using a multifaceted approach. The Centers for Disease Control, and I have a quote here, baseline testing should include a check for concussion symptoms as well as balance and cognitive, such as concentration and memory assessments. Computerized or pencil, paper and pencil neuropsychological tests may be included as a piece of the overall baseline to assess an athlete's concentration, memory, or reaction time. Okay. So CDC statement right there. Um, I'll, I'll get to that, that quote. Uh, NCAA Diagnosis and Management of Sports Related Concussion Best Practices Handbook. The National Athletic Trainers Association Position Statement on the Management of Sport Concussion in 2014. The Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation Guidelines for Diagnosing and Managing Pediatric Concussion said that there was grade B evidence for recommending that all athletes in high-risk sport consider getting a baseline test. Proceedings from the International Ice Hockey Summit had in 2019 had six recommendations that were put forward and basically they recommended having um, baseline testing included for all uh, athletes uh, regardless of um, um, level. So that was that was their sixth recommendation. So the groups discouraging use, Parachute Canada. So in the entire world you have everyone encouraging or at least saying that there's you know enough evidence to say that it could be beneficial uh, and we're still trying to figure some stuff out and then you have groups discouraging use being parachute Canada so sad state of affairs I think there's misinformation it's misguided statement um, and yet it's still being pushed onto sports clubs so let's summarize baseline testing can be helpful when utilized in the right way using the right testing protocols Testing is to help with return to sport decision making, not diagnosis. And so I think that's what people need to kind of get around their uh, around in their heads of symptoms are gone. OK, let's see if there's any functional deficits remaining. It can only ever help to hold an athlete back. It can never, ever be used to speed anything up. It can never, ever be used to make um, a, a, a worse decision. It can only ever be used to make a safer decision. Okay, let me, let, me, let me just repeat that. It can only ever help to hold an athlete back, right? Because their symptoms have gone away and they've done the protocol and now we're using this to see if there's anything else that may be going on under the surface that we're not able to pick up just clinically, okay? So if you're looking for this testing, look for trained clinics and clinicians that offer a battery of tests. Anyone offering just a SCAT and they think that it's a good baseline or if they're just doing impact testing and think there's a good baseline, 
it's not so steer clear of that what you want is a you know a, a clinician that has training in this area that uses a variety of different tests that's evidence based that pulls everything together and says you know for kids we do this because you know these tests have been validated but these ones haven't so somebody that actually looks at the evidence somebody with training in this uh, if you want an easy place to go, obviously my bias is that I'm the founder of Complete Concussions. So if you go to completeconcussions.com, we have a list of clinics. They're all around the world and we do a standardized approach to concussion and baseline testing. Uh, everything connects with our smartphone application. So everything is kind of put in one, uh, one kind of tight package. So there it is. That's the evidence on baseline testing. There's some confusion and I wanted to kind of use this time to clear that up so that people have an understanding of the entire landscape in this space and they realize that there's a lot of evidence showing that baseline testing can be something helpful to include. So if you are a parent, if you are an athlete, if you are a coach, if you are a sports organization, if you are a school, please consider the fact that there is a lot of different information out there. There is a lot of evidence to support the use of this, but it needs to be done in the right way. That's it for me today. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. I'm now going to go and answer some questions and comments that I see coming in over on the live session. And for the rest of you guys, I will see you next week.